the last thing you want somebody to say to you is, gee, you play good for a girl. I mean, nobody's ever dared to say that to me, ever. They, if they said it, they're six foot under. Hi, I'm Susie Quattro. Um, I play bass. I play bass since 1964. I got arms like a wrestler. I play bonus on strings. They're good strings, actually. My title is the Queen of Rock and Roll, which I accept. Like that. And like that. I don't actually do gender, and I never have. I've always been like a tomboy. And I don't consider myself a female musician. I am a musician, but I am a female musician. I was having success at the first time when there weren't any other girls around. So I was on my own with the guys. And I learned how to be one of the guys. You know, you can hold your own and tell a joke and be one of the guys. But, and I tell women this all the time. There's a little line right here. Little line. Don't step across it. And that's how you keep your femininity within that industry. It's called respect. Don't step over it. And even if I'm telling a, a slightly risque joke, don't step over that line with me because you'll hear about it. A lot of people that know me well say it looks like I was born with a bass in my hand. When we took family trips, um, because five kids, you don't fly too much money. So we drove, and we always would have little sing songs in the car, and we all would take our harmony notes. And my dad would always be in the front going, ba doom, ba doom, ba doom, ba doom, doom. And I used to think, that's just the best part. My father was a musician all his life. He played uh, all the keyboards, accordion, violin, bass. Every instrument you want was in our house. So we all grew up putting on family shows, all five kids. I started on the bongos, by the way, very important to point out that I actually play bongos. Uh, it's, a, it's a standing joke, but I do play. Uh, that was my first instrument, and my father used to let me go with him to his gig on a Sunday and play. 25 cents I got for a show, overpaid. I read and write and play classical piano, and I played drums in the orchestra at school, so I was in the percussion section, and I was first chair which means that when you did the rudiment tests and they place you in order of how good you are, I was number one. And that really pissed off all the guys and I've continued to do that all my life. Um, 14, we started a band and it was an all-girl band and all the girls chose an instrument and I didn't speak up quick enough. And I kind of went, hello, what am I gonna play? And my elder sister Patty said, you're playing the bass. So I said, okay. And I went to my dad. I said, do you have a bass for me? He said, sure. And he gave me a 1957 Fender Precision. Stripe up the back of the neck, sunburst finish, gold scratch plate, the Rolls Royce of basses, which I didn't know at the time. And seriously, put it on, started to play, and it was like perfect. This is the only bass that you can plug directly into the board at a studio and it's perfect. It's the only bass you can do that with. Everything else you need to add a little bit of amp or something, but this, this, is, this is studio bass. And here's, you wanna see the back again. That's when you know it's mine. Cause my, the zipper or the buckle or whatever, every bass I own has the scratches on the back. So this is authentic. The P bass round round, um, I can't remember ever using any of the strings in Rotosan. I've been using it forever. This particular bass, it, it is, it's, it's warm. The whole, the whole setup is warm, you know? That's like Spinal Tap. You can go out and have lunch and that'll still be gone. <laughs> I 
was in the second wave of the Pleasure Seekers, and that group was called Cradle. And that was the band that, first of all, Elektra Records saw, Jack Holtzman, and he offered me a solo contract, even though I was in the background. And Mickey Most came to Detroit with Jeff Beck and Cozy Powell to record at Motown, and he also came to see the band, and again, I was at the back, came up to two songs, and he also offered me a solo contract. Now, Jack said, come to New York, and I will make you into the next Janis Joplin. I'm not the second anybody. Not me. I, I knew I was unique, and I'm nothing like Janis Joplin anyway. Just balls, maybe. We both have balls. But uh, she's she a blues singer, you know? I'm a rock and roller. Mickey Most said, come to England, and I'll make you into the first Susie Quattro. So I came here. England, when I arrived here, it was like a culture shock. I mean, it really was. You didn't really have any radio. You didn't have um, hardly any TV. And everything was so small. <laughs> That's what I noticed. Everything was small. Mickey couldn't find the, the road for me. He couldn't produce me. He recognized I, I was star material, but he didn't know what I was. So we kept experimenting in the studio with different kinds of sounds, and I was writing and blah, blah, blah. And then the Slade tour put that band really together, started to write our own stuff, and then it all took off from there. Then we found the sound. Can the can, boom, done. This is called a Les Paul Professional Recording Bass. It's low impedance, and you need a transformer to use it. So you had to, you had to lug that thing around. I played this for about three years. I came to London with this bass, and it's the heaviest thing you've ever lifted in your life. It's, it's ridiculous. And I don't know how, but I carried this myself to and from, because I didn't have money for the underground, uh, Earl's Court to London. I, how did I do that? I don't know. But I did play it a long time. Oh, and it's so heavy, I kept pulling it out. It was so heavy, I'd play it on stage and bang! So we had to screw these up like that, that long into the body so it never comes out again. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. So I've been doing a lot of iconic theater shows. I even played the Opera House in Sydney. Mm. Um, so I've been doing this for about three or four years now, doing my solo two-hour shows with an interval. This is what I built myself up to, and if I'm honest, it's my favorite thing to do. You know, you know that every person in the audience is there to see you, which is a really good feeling, you know? Not that you're part of a, a big show and doesn't matter even that you're headlining. It's nice to know everybody's there to see you. The Royal Albert Hall is a special gig. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I've been practicing here in the front room, and I always have a little laugh because sometimes people walk by and can you imagine somebody walking by and seeing this lunatic in her front room going right and going... <laughs> and they, I can hear them saying, you know, Susie Quattro lives there. She's lost it. <laughs> He'd been 14, um, same as his mum. I started in heavy bands, but I wasn't playing guitar at first. Um, I was playing keyboards and samples and stuff, and then I was really unhappy playing gigs, which is obviously not what you want to be doing. My mum and dad have always said, if you're not happy in music, you can't do it. And the guys in the band just said, why don't you try playing guitar when I was 21? And I thought, I'll give it a go and locked myself away for, for a year. I, I didn't see, I didn't go out one weekend for a whole year. And my mates would pull up outside the track here, play their music really loud and be shouting my name. And I'm like, I can't come out, I've got to, Gotta play. I've got to get this right. And I set up a, a Marshall stack and a PA system up in my bedroom when I used to live here. And I practiced with that every day for a year and mum never told me to turn it down. She never, you never, and it must have shook this house. I had a hundred watt, hundred watt Marshall stack, two caps, I didn't actually and, a, and a PA system. I'd put my band's CD on, 
crank it up, turn the amp up, and just go mental. <laughs> and she never told me to turn it down. Never. It's never quite normal, actually, down. the way I was brought up. Yeah, it just didn't bother her, and that was me for like a whole year, and <laughs> you know, I, I, I never looked back after that. I, I'm, I'm fully uh, addicted and obsessed with guitars, and I've only ever used rotor sound. And I can honestly say that I've obviously had other brands of strings in my life, but the first pack of, the first set of strings I ever brought were Roto Blues, 10 to 52s, and I've never looked back. So every single guitar I have, unless it's an E flat, I use Roto 11s. But I've got 40 guitars and 30 of them have got Roto Sound Blues on them. He finally came to me in uh, early 2019 and said, I, I need to write with you. And he said he needs to write with me. He said he has to. He showed me what he had. We made him into songs. We went into the studio. And we were actually just doing demos and having fun. And on about the third track, I believe it was about the third track, I turned to Richard and Mike, whose studio it is, and I said, my God, we're making an album. And it really did get serious. We didn't know. We did, had no idea it was going to go like it. Was, it wasn't planned. And we started to make this album. And I always say that um, the first album was our Feet Wet album because we'd never worked together before. We didn't quite know where we were going, what we do. And I remember I said to everybody, I said to you and Mike, I said, we're not going to push this album this way, that way, that way. I said, let's leave it wide open and whatever happens, happens. And that album is very wide open. And then we started to do this one when the lockdown came. Uh, Richard was on the road. You were not That's even going to be home. To be, but... Supposed to be. I was going to be doing 85 shows. Susie turned 70, a big deal, you know? And um, lockdown, so the company had taken up the option for the next album already. And I said to Richard, right, we have now the opportunity to write this album. So he went out in the studio, and I sat on the patio. and. The devil and me got recorded, but you got your confidence level up here after no control. You really got yourself sure of yourself. And then he put his foot down. <laughs> and it's a big foot. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted it to be as, as important as the first album. That's what you kept saying. And you kept saying, trust me, trust me, trust me. And everybody says it's diverse, and you don't get that, do you? But it is. Oh, I don't think it is diverse. Yeah, but every, every, every single journalist has said, this is a very diverse album, yet we had one, we had one aim in mind. It's so funny how it comes yeah. to your ears that way. Yeah, and the and the bass and drums were all recorded live at Rack for the Devil and Me as well, which made a huge difference for when I went in and recorded the guitars because I had that, I had that live energy to record to, which you can't fake. It doesn't matter how good of a musician no. you are, you a live recording will give you the sound of a live recording and if it's not live you can try until the cows come home you will not get it the bass is the easiest part of recording on a suzy quattro project is, is the bass because she's that good that no matter what you ask her to try there's no effort to learn it it's bang she just does it and that's because they had to do it back then like the, the first album was recorded in five days yes now you can spend two, three years doing an album and it still won't be finished, you know, and there's something to be said for that innocence and that energy in, in, the, in what you're doing, you know, if you, if you suddenly become elitist and it's going to take you two years to record an album, and personally I think you need to seriously consider going back in time a little bit and discovering why you started doing this in the first place, which is what we did with you. Yes. Take you back to that, I wanted to take you back to that original feeling of when you first sat down with your sisters and went, what are we going to do? You know, and, because I didn't want an album of just good songs, you want an album. Yeah, and, and it is an album, and everybody has commented on it. The strangest thing is, it's got the best reviews of my entire career. Um, what I found myself thinking as we were doing this album was, I started to see me fresh. I saw me through his eyes, which is the strangest thing in the world to say. But it was like, because he was all excited doing all this. To, so I'm seeing how he's seeing me, just like what you just said. So I'm, I'm like a kid again. That was the whole point. Yeah. 
And, 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 and you were. Yeah, you I, were. Was. I was happy, smiling all the time. Okay, ready? <laughs> I got the devil in me, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Susie Quattro, and I don't play Rotosaur. <laughs>